So when you were in expat, where were you at? I was in Mexico. So I went down oh. to Monterrey and Querétaro mm. and uh, opened up three companies down there. So I did a, an electric motor company doing switch reluctance motors for a pump company. They're a global pump company. Do have about a half a billion a year in sales. So I started a wow. joint venture there. I uh, did a flywheel energy storage company uh, storing wow. energy kinetically and uh, carbon fiber wrapped um, drums. They're spinning at 50,000 RPM in a vacuum. Wow. And uh, we actually won as a as an immigrant to Mexico. I got to appreciate that. Uh, we actually won best uh, uh, clean tech company 2017 mm. with the flywheel energy storage stuff. So that was interesting. And then I did a 3D printing company as well. So before I, and I met my now wife. Like I said, we're not going to talk about the number of ex wives, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but my now wife, she's Turkish. So, and she runs. She, and, she <laughs> ran away from Turkey and you ran from the United States. Wow. Yeah, exactly. A marriage made in Mexico. <laughs> That's exactly right. And so it was, but she's automotive. That's what's so good about it when you find someone who's automotive because she runs tier one automotive supplier companies and wiring harness is what she was doing. Oh, so, cool. so therefore there was that instant connection about the automotive industry, that type of thing, you know? So, and it was kind of neat that now I, I could say I have a partner who's, uh, helps the lift the, the heavy loads for the company yeah. and all the automotive stuff because she loves automotive. She's, she, the things that are to me bureaucratic nonsense and things that drive me crazy to her, that's just something she deals with on yeah. a daily basis. Yeah. So, so she can deal with bureaucracy, all the paperwork, all the details, let me do the creative stuff, you know? Mm. And, uh, and so that's how we've kind of bifurcated the, the, the job duties. Yeah. Well, that's a good deal. Um, as you know, Sue, my wife uh, works here too, and she's in with the uh, financial guys right now, finding out about all this stuff. And, um, uh, I, Sue and I are both uh, on the creative path, <laughs> neither one of them. We've always depended on other people when it comes to finance and taxes and all this other stuff. Yeah. Now we're finding out that, hey, <laughs> maybe we were a little smarter than some of the people that were in here before. Mm -hmm. And we asked these questions, and, oh, no, no, it's all fine. Don't worry about it. Well, I'm worried now. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's cool if you can have that, uh, that magic formula. And learning that, though, I, I, there's a book called Loon Shots that's by Safi Bacall. And mm -hmm. Loon Shots, I don't know if you've ever heard of it. But no. they talk about there's two types of people. There's the soldiers and the creatives. And and Safi Bacall has done this thing where he went all the way back to Vannevar Bush times, you know, way back, you know, to show how this there's this – the, how you, you have you have to be able to manage the creatives and manage the soldiers. Soldiers like to do the same thing repeatedly because yeah, they have right. measurable results. Creatives don't like to be bound by that. And one of the analogies that he used is uh, Apple early on, that when <coughs> Steve Jobs and uh, <coughs> Wozniak were, uh, were were in the company, they basically had the creatives in one building and Steve Jobs' soldiers over in another building. And the area in between, they actually call the demilitarized zone. <laughs> 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 and, and, and Jobs would refer to Wozniak and his team as clowns. And it got so much that Wozniak actually wore a clown nose on his name tag uh. there. But so when they, so when they kicked out jobs, you know, he had actually happened to invest in this little, uh, company, in San Francisco called Pixar. Yeah. And when he went to Pixar, cause he didn't have a job, he had nothing to do and to see what goes on at Pixar. He saw that all of a sudden they got creatives and soldiers seamlessly working together. And that's when he first started saying, okay, wait a second, you know, there's something to this. Yeah. Mm. And, and so he started researching. And, of course, that's what basically allowed Apple to flourish is when he came back after doing the Next computer, if you remember that. Because yeah. he started applying the same Pixar principles at Next. And Next, they had the fostering, the innovation was just yeah. exploding there. And then, of course, he came back to Apple. And then Apple flourished as a result. But he, the, in that book, though, they talk about managing the, the, the creatives and the soldiers. And that, when you, and that was the first time reading that book. I said, okay, I'm a creative, you know, because I always could always understand how come I don't have the patience for all this other minutia and this stuff patience. like that. Patience, no kidding. <laughs> I have to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> but and it's vice versa. Soldiers can't stand the creatives. And so what I found with my wife now, she's a soldier. I'm I'm the creative one, and so that's why it's like she can't stand. Well, she'll come to me like when you're doing prototyping programs. The funny thing about prototyping is I always tell people it's like they say, so what? How do we do this? And you say we don't know yet. It's never been done before, yeah. so we got to start doing yeah. it. Yeah. And so to a soldier, they're like looking. Wait a second. Where's the checklist? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. That's what I want to see. You know. 
And so, but it's, once you start learning those things about, you know, which camp you fall on, are you a creative, are you a soldier, mm-hmm. you know, then life gets easier in that sense, you know, but, uh, but you both, being, you both being creative, so that's interesting because that's, uh, you know, that's, that's why, you know, before, uh, if you don't have someone who's the soldier, then you got to hire someone yeah. you know, who's that soldier. And that seems like that's what creatives do. At the end of the day, starting a business is not easy. Yeah. Um, so what did you do with your businesses in? Um well, in, when I went to Mexico in 2014, that's when I basically shut down the business in Texas. Yeah. And because I decided at that point that, okay, you know, I'm going to, I went to Mexico to start new companies doing partnerships and such like that. But then when I, after I met my wife there, we were, we were getting harassed every time we come back to the U.S. to go fly around the world out of Houston because the Customs Border Protection would be like, are you going to overstay a visa? All this stuff there. And it's like, we live in Mexico. You know, I, I don't, we're just going, th- passing through to go to the airport, yeah. you know. And so one time they threatened to um, uh, deport her. As we're standing, this guy, I guess he needed, his, maybe his wife was beating him at home or something like that, you know, and he needs to flex his authority muscles or something like that. But, and so, because and they would always ask, it's like, well, if you guys are together, how come she doesn't have her passport? And all that stuff, you know. So, because well, we hadn't done our citizenship, we live in Mexico. Yeah. So basically, we made the decision. Then it's like, okay, let's go back to the U.S. And b- because when you do the citizenship thing, you may or may not know this that you have to live fifty percent of your time for three years right. in the country. You can't leave. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so that and that stands if you're in Mexico and you do it, it means we can't leave Mexico for fifty percent of the time. Yeah. Or you come to the U.S. can't leave the U.S. So. So we decided to move back so we could do the citizenship thing and stuff like that. Yeah. And um, and that's when I said, this time I'm not going to start my own company. I'm going to go to work for someone else. Yeah. And I did that, and it was interesting. We went to a company in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, doing electric motors. And uh, because, again, I was uh, after doing all that lightweight composite car stuff, people inevitably start asking, can you do the drivetrains? And so I got interested in switch reluctance motors and, and all these other motor technologies out there. But um, so I came, we came back to the U.S. in 2018, October 2018, and then uh, went to Fort Worth and uh, started an electric motor company there. That guy, he'd, um, he'd sold his, uh, it was a streaming company to IBM. He'd sold it for like $160 million. And so mm-hmm. his father had a motor idea. And they basically started this new electric motor company. It had four rotors. It's Linear Labs, uh, the company. So there's two ra- two radial rotors and two axial flux rotors. No kidding. Yeah. So then managing four air gaps in a motor was challenging. So. Wow. I mean, <laughs> because you, you <laughs> that has to, that's a very tight tolerance yeah. to start off with. And if you got four of them, yeah, the stack up. You think about the tolerance. Yeah, stack-up. tolerance yeah. stack ups are like. And, and that proved to be the difficulty in the motor, but we basically designed it such that it could be fully made by machines yeah. uh, in an automated cell. We even got a, Ebru and I, uh, my wife, she, we, we even got, uh, we worked with the rest of the team to get a $68.9 million tax credit grant from the city of Fort Worth for an industry 4.0 manufacturing facility for electric motors. Wow. So it was pretty, and we raised a bunch of money for, for that company as well, working with them. But, but yeah, it was, it was, it was quite a nice exercise because basically I got to go into the fully automated thing where the motors could be fully assembled without a human touching them. And so that means you can make motors in the U S you know, and that's kind of, but Everything I learned in there, plus I'd been working on this other motor technology since 2012, uh, before I went to Mexico, and it was um, the first motor made that has no back irons in it and uh, no magnets, so really? it was a full aluminum structure with laminations in it, and it was a 100 and 124 pole motor, and uh, this thing I got videos of it. It moves; it's super smooth, like a turntable. That kind of yeah. that's, that was instantly the thing I thought of is you could actually play a record on it. It's so smooth, <laughs> you know. But uh, that was the first time I did a motor with no back irons, no permanent magnets, and those are dual axial flux there. Wow! But I kept iterating that motor through time, and that's why in July this year, at Vey Electra, we just spun out modal motors, and that's the one I, we talked at the battery show yeah. about that. But so that's another one that we're. Starting here in the Detroit area is that company. We already got Centropolis, you know, who you're involved with as well. Yeah. Those guys are investing in it and have given us grants as well. And uh, so it's that. And we what, can. What about the MEDC? Have they gotten involved? Yeah, we're 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 actually talking to them about an, an industry 4.0 grant, but it's a small little amount. But we're trying to get bigger money too, and mm-hmm. we're working with Dan over at Centropolis on that yeah, yeah. as well. 
But this, uh, but building electric motors that if you have no back iron, the biggest losses in electric motor come f- from the back iron. Technically, it's about fifty three percent of the losses. The, the others being I square R losses, the current losses. Right. But uh, so the back iron losses. If you have no back iron, now suddenly you got a much higher efficiency over a broad speed range. You know, mm. to do that with. So that's the kind of the idea behind that. But the biggest thing is that it can be made in USA because you don't have all this touch labor. If you if you ever seen how you guys can go online and you can see how the Chinese build motors and you see a lot of women with small hands that are wrapping the the copper wow. in these motors to build these things. So it's very labor intensive the way they're done like that. So in order for the US to compete globally, you know, we want to rely on I I guess I'll call it smart labor. So you compensate people for high skills, those kinds of things, but the machine is doing all the monotonous stuff. Yeah. And, and especially when it comes to tight tolerances, you know, maintaining that air gap, like we were talking about, those things have to be done by machines. 